Uh, so my task today is to talk about uh, carbon storage in the reduced mantle. As we'll see, and I, as I think many of you know, much of the mantle is reduced, so that means that we're talking about carbon storage in, in, in most of the mantle. Carbon may well be greatest, uh, or the greatest amount of carbon may well be in the core, as we heard earlier this morning, but in terms of the accessible earth, the largest reservoir is the mantle. It was referred to, uh, I think yesterday or the day before, as, as the battery, or excuse me, as, as, as the gas tank. I tend to call it the battery because it is the reservoir that is exchanging with the surface and, and, and allowing what we call deep earth carbon cycle to occur. We care not just that there is carbon in the mantle, but we care about the form of the carbon in the mantle. Right? It's not simply a passive place where carbon is stored. It's also a place where carbon has the possibility of affecting interior Earth dynamics. And that's because depending on the phase that carbon is in, it may affect, first of all, the geophysical properties, and second of all, the geochemical properties. Uh, in particular, and most, uh, and most uh, importantly, if the carbon is in any time in a molten phase, or like as in a carbonatite, then uh, the, the, its ability to take part in mass transfers is greatly enhanced. So we care where the carbon is and wh where the carbon uh, is actually in, in terms of the phases. There's a great deal of variety of carbon phases, and I think we're going to hear a, bit, a little bit more about that from Wendy Mao in the talk that follows me in terms of the mineralogy of carbon. But beyond the mineralogy of carbon, we also care about the petrology of carbon, which is to say that once we understand the diversity of possible phases that can be stable, we also need to take into account the fact that those phases are going to, and in fact indeed will react with their surroundings, and their surroundings may determine, determine not what phases are possible, but what phases are actually there. So this work uh, is, was actually the, the PhD work of Zhang Zhou, known in the United States, or known in the West as, as Johnny Zhang. Uh, the only reason I'm first author here is because I'm the one who's giving the talk. Uh, th this, th this work was not funded by DCL, it was funded by the National Science Foundation, but as uh, the previous speaker mentioned, the genesis of this actually began at the first international DCO conference in Beijing, where I first met Johnny Zhang, and the year afterwards he came to Minnesota to, to do his PhD. So this work even though the, the, the dollars came from NSF, the inspiration actually came from DCO. Do I, how do I advance the slides? Green, this is, oh, there we go, that, there we go, all right. <laughs> really fundamental things can trip me up. Okay, so this is meant in some ways to be a bit of an update, right, a, a, a decadal survey. And so this is a paper from uh, a, more or less the beginning of, of a DCO time uh, that Raj Dasgupta and I put together, and it's a summary of uh, a bunch of different things, but it, it's a summary of the, di of the different possible phases that are storing uh, carbon in the mantle. And you can see that in much of the mantle, we have these reduced phases of diamond or iron or iron carbide. Uh, we're kind of agnostic about it at that point, right? Just a, just a listing. Uh, this is brand new. Uh, it came out in Elements, I, I, guess, I guess, this month. And the listing of carbon in the, in the deeper ports of the mantle is, is similarly agnostic, diamond, iron carbide, carbonatites, or iron nickel liquid. And what I'm going to argue is, is that all of this misses actually probably the most important phase of all. Right? So uh, if, if, if we go through it and, and go through the process, we may actually understand that, that, that none of these lists actually contain what are more than likely to be the principal phase. Okay, so there's a, a, a logic train to this, and the first part of the logic train is that much of the mantle in the deeper parts of the mantle are, is reduced. So uh, we know that in the upper mantle, the conditions are fairly oxidized, and carbon is present chiefly as carbo carbonate or crystalline carbonate or CO2 or carbonatite or carbonatite liquid, perhaps, but uh, abundant evidence shows us that with increasing depth, the mantle becomes more reduced. And so the, the logical thought process that we get to is, oh, it must be a reduced phase and it's high pressure, so therefore it must be diamond that's down there. Right? So, much, much, so the, the, the first place we get to is, yes, it's, it's, it's all in diamond. But then when we consider how reduced the mantle actually is, we realize that there are other complications. So uh, lots of experiments show us, and it, perhaps in fact the whole reason that we think that the mantle at depth is reduced is because mantle becomes sufficiently reduced 
that we begin to precipitate some sort of alloy, right? an iron-nickel alloy. And that iron-nickel alloy in the shallow parts of the mantle, or at least in the intermediate depths of the upper mantle, is initially a nickel-rich alloy. And that nickel-rich alloy um, is, first of all, uh, mostly nickel, as shown here. Uh, this is the nickel to iron ratio. And there's a very small amount of it, because there isn't very much nickel in the mantle. But as pressure increases and the mantle becomes yet more reduced, more and more of the alloy becomes iron, so there's more and more iron dissolved into the alloy. And because there's an increase of metal uh, and iron going into the alloy, there's an, in there's an increase in the total amount of alloy present. Okay? So previously we said uh, car carbon in diamond because the mantle is reduced. Turns out that the mantle is probably, in many cases, too reduced for diamond, which is kind of a concept that when I first stumbled across it, uh, it was a bit... Uh, you think of diamond as being very reduced. But the problem is that if there's alloy and there's diamond, they react together and they, and, and they form carbide. There's no place in the phase diagram of iron carbon, which is what this is here, iron carbon, where diamond and alloy coexist. They're, they're going to react to form a carbide. So the next part in the thought process is, OK, so it's probably not diamond. It's probably in carbide. But that's problematic, too, because carbide has a very low melting temperature, right? And as a consequence, if there is a carbide and we subject it to mantle temperature pressures and along the geotherm, we'll find that that carbide is not crystalline carbide, but molten carbide. So, so then we get to the conclusion that the carbon must be in a carbide melt. I should say, of course, that we're talking about the reduced portion of the mantle, and we've heard a fair amount uh, about interesting uh, oxidized phases at great depth. And those two must exist, for example, in oxidized domains where subduction is, is occurring or uh, sub that have been influenced by subduction. But most of the mantle is this reduced form. And so we're getting to these, uh, we're getting to these more, uh, well, I, what I consider to be more com complex petrology associated with these reactions. So, uh, the diagram here on the left is simply iron carbon, and it's showing, again, that there's no field of stability of alloy and, uh, and, and, and diamond or graphite together. Notice also that, of course, that there's a certain amount of solubility of carbon in the iron metal itself, you know, like steel. And so th that later is going gonna, is gonna to show up as being a, a, a player in this. This diagram on the right, and actually I think I have a, a better version of it, or two different versions of it over here that we can talk about, is, is that, in fact, the iron-carbon relations are complicated by the fact that what, I, what you've already told you is that it's not iron, it's iron-nickel. And so if we think about iron and carbon, whoops, um, can I go back? Yeah. Uh, if, if we think about iron and carbon, this, uh, this shows again that, that, that carbide forms, there's no coexistence of graphite and alloy over here, and there's, a, and there's melt stable over here. But if you go over to the right on the nickel-rich side of things, in fact, graphite and alloy can coexist, and the melting temperature is much higher. So the fact that it's an iron-nickel alloy means that it's complicated. The, the simple thing, oh, it's going to melt and make iron carbide, maybe. It depends on the composition of the alloy. So it's getting a little bit more complicated. But there's another player here, and that is sulfur. What did Terry Plank say the other day, that sulfur is the new carbon? We can't, we, we, we can't understand carbon storage and reduced mantle without also taking into account the existence of sulfur. And the reason for that is because sulfur in the mantle, or rather sulfide in the mantle, is molten. And so here are some experiments that we did uh, a, a couple years back, and this is showing the solidus of sulfide, and it's compared to a mantle adiabat, basically through much of the upper mantle, and you can see that sulfide melts at a much lower temperature, so the sulfide is molten. Uh, here's the temp experiments at much higher pressures of, of various kinds, where in the presence of a reduced conditions, where iron, uh, the activity of iron is high, the melting of the sulfide is again well into the lower mantle, far lower in temperature than the mantle geotherm. So all through this scenario, there's molten sulfide sitting there. And again, you can't just think about the carbon in isolation. You have to think about the potential of the carbon to react with other things. And carbide liquid and sulfide liquid are mutually miscible. 
And so here are some experiments, I apologize for the small print on here, that show, uh, in, in, in this case, a, a carbide liquid and a sulfide liquid coexisting. You can see the concentrations of carbon and sulfur in each of them. Uh, if one goes, to, this is actually in the pure iron sulfur system, if one adds a small amount of nickel to them, the miscibility gap disappears and you have completely miscible iron, nickel, uh, carbon, sulfide liquid. And so in order to understand where the carbon might be, you have uh, to, to consider its reactions with the sulfide liquid. So some complications. So, uh, the, the first one I've already told you about, the activities of iron and nickel are going to vary with depth. First, there's going to be a high nickel activity, and then the iron activity is going to increase with, with, with increasing depth. And the sulfide liquid is going to vary its composition accordingly. It's going to be more iron rich or more nickel rich. It's going to have a higher metal sulfide ratio when the, when the activity of iron is greater, because uh, th that's how the, the, li the sulfide liquid must respond. And furthermore, as illustrated here, the amount of carbon that dissolves in that sulfide liquid is strongly dependent on both the metal sulfide ratio of the sulfide liquid and also the iron nickel ratio of the sulfide liquid. Those of you who know me and know my work know that I like to get away with the simplest model possible. If I can get away with mass balance and some partition coefficients, if that's going to explain the system, then that's what I will do. Not possible here. It's too complex, too many moving parts. You have to do the full thermodynamics. And uh, with apologies to Mark Viorso, who's uh, in the audience here and who was my PhD advisor, I, I, I do follow up Bernie Wood's dictum. And Bernie Wood's dictum is that thermodynamics is like changing diapers. You do it, but you don't want to talk about it. <laughs> so uh, what we did is we, we did a full thermodynamic model, but we cheated a little bit in the sense that there was already a beautiful thermodynamic model for the system iron nickel sulfur that came from a group of metallurgists at the University of Wisconsin from 30 years ago. This is a paper from 1987. And we took that model, which was a low pressure model, but a complete thermodynamic description of the mixing properties and the, and the standard state properties of iron nickel sulfur throughout the compositional range. We, uh, we extended it to higher pressure by uh, including the effects of you know, volumes and things like that. And then we calibrated it into the carbon system by looking at the carbon solubility experiments that I already showed you, which are here. Uh, so this is our calibration for um, for the pure nickel system, this is the calibration for the pure, uh, for, for the nickel-free system, the pure iron system, and we could, we could draw isoplasts in between. The carbon solubility there gives us the mixing properties between the carbonaceous component and the nickel and, and, and the iron components as, as well. And so that gets us more or less to the conclusion. And that is, if you do it, just calculate it, what you find, imposing a certain depth FO2 relationship that we take from Frost, whoops, that's not where I meant to go, right, there we go, uh, Frost and McCammon, 2008, we see, of course, that in the shallow mantle, there's carbonatite stable, and the sulfide is sitting there uh, as, as, as a molten liquid, but there's not a lot of solubility in the, uh, in, in, in the sulfide there because conditions are not sufficiently reduced, and, and the solubility of carbon in the very oxidized sulfide liquid is, um, is low. But then, The, the liquid and graphite replace the carbonatite because conditions become too reduced. And then the liquid uh, becomes diamond saturated because we get to a sufficiently high pressure. And then finally we pass into a region where it's just sulfide liquid. And then eventually, of course, a, a, an alloy does saturate and that alloy is not going to be iron nickel, it's going to be steel, it's going to have a certain amount of carbon in it. And then, so therefore, depending on the total amount of carbon present, the host for carbon in the deep reduced mantle will be sulfide liquid and steel. And the only conditions under which we will get diamond is if there's so much carbon present, if we have a carbon rich environment, that it overwhelms the ability of the sulfide liquid to, to, to take it. And therefore we would get the assemblage sulfide liquid plus diamond. And that's my conclusion. It's, uh, the, the, the place to look for carbon in the mantle is with the sulfur. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Do you have a question for Mark? Great. Hey, Mark, that's spectacular. Uh, what about the mobility of this liquid? Ah, 
Good question. So sulfide liquid is known under low pressure conditions to be not particularly wetting and therefore its mobility is low. But there's some evidence, uh, particularly from <laughs> diamonds, for example, from the deep diamonds that, uh, that, that Evan Smith has, has found, that, um, that, that, that it is in part mobile. It's probably not as mobile as a, or it's certainly not as mobile as a carbonatite. But, uh, but yes, it's, it's a lot, whole lot more mobile than diamond. Yes, Chris? Hey, I have another quick question. Um, so given that so much of the lower mantle is composed of bridgmanite and ferropericlase, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't expect that carbon would go much into those phases, but have, exper have high pressure experiments been done to quantify? Uh, Craig, this was Craig Schiffrey's point the other day. We, ha we, we have actually ex done experiments in the upper mantle for the carbon solubility in upper mantle minerals, olivine and so forth, and also the Bayreuth group did it a number of years ago, and, and the solubility is very, very low. Uh, there are a little bit of data for the transition zone minerals, and again, the carbon solubility is very low. Uh, it is probably a minority component, uh, it, but, but it's possible that more experiments could show us otherwise. I have a quick question mm -hmm. for you. Uh, so you showed that as uh, you go deeper and more reduced, you start melting more and more iron, and the iron concentration of your metal is going to increase compared yes. to nickel. And then you might hit that point where you're going to have phase immiscibility again with the sulfides and carbides separating. Do you expect that would be a, something that no, fits the, in there on your the, the experiments that I showed were at 2 GPA and 1600 degrees C, where for the pure iron system you have mutual miscibility between the sulfide and the carbide. At sufficiently high temperatures and pressures, that miscibility goes away even for the iron rich system. Even for the iron rich system. Let's thank Mark again. Thank you.